Hey folks, um, welcome to the next episode of the D4H Bravo Zulu live stream series. Uh, today we're being joined by David Wilson. David is the training manager at York Rescue Boat. Um, just bring him in here. Hiya, David. Hello, how are you doing? Yeah, good, thanks. Thanks for joining us on the live stream. That's right. So um, York Rescue Boat have uh, been using all of the D4H products, like in personnel training, equipment management, incident reporting, and very recently incident management. Um, and uh, David's been good enough to offer it towards the second half of this call. First, we're gonna learn a little bit about York Rescue Boat, what their challenges are, how they operate, respond, their equipment. Um, but in the second half of the call, David's gonna share some screens from their D4H accounts and, and just show you how they're using it for a, a rescue uh, a rescue boat effectively, or you're not just rescue, right? You're doing land-based and um, water-based response. Yes, we're a combined, um, a combined boat and foot team, um, and the two are sort of fully interoperable with each other. Yeah, excellent. And so you formed in, I think the idea was 2014, What and the, the sort of charity was formed. What was the, why, why, what was the kind of, uh, uh, the, the thought process in that? Why, why were you going to the, the, the first half of 2014, there was um, four fatalities in, in York and the rivers. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been sort of normally two or three fatalities per year, but they get spread out over time. But yeah. the first half of 2014, there was four fatalities fairly close to each other. And that was the trigger. It was a case of we've got to do something, yeah, um, just to put some sort of presence on the river. So at that point, this, the team started fundraising, grabbed the initial team together, um, work out the back of, a, back of a car with a bucket, and going. We want some money for a boat. Through the initial concept, and then in had, had someone on thing. had someone in that group been involved in rescue before? One of the um, one of the founders. The actual the founder, he was friends with a lad who died in the Rivers. Um, but before that, there was someone who was a police sergeant, so he's done police search advice things, but there'd been no one for the, from the initial group had done yeah. anything to do with search and rescue. So quite the challenge. And did you affiliate with a, an organization or how did you kind of know what to do? Where, where did you start? To start with, it was um, scrubbing around in the, sort of scrubbing around blind. I joined the team just after the, they started the fundraising and I come from a military and also a search and rescue background. So I did my, my bits and pieces in uh, my ideas in fairly quickly. We teamed up with an organization, a charity called surf life saving GB. Um, mm -hmm. And they were starting to get into the flood rescue side of things. So from the, um, from beach rescue. And again, we use their knowledge to help build the team up as well. Okay. Brilliant. And so you do sort of proactive foot and boat patrols along the river in York. I, I guess, do you know what we didn't do at the start of this, and I normally do, is, is show people where we're talking to people. From. Uh, just tell me a little bit, well, I'm getting a map up. Tell me a little bit about, you're operating in a in a city area or an urban area, effectively, through the river. Yeah, we operate from right in the middle of York. Um, York's got two rivers. It's the main river, is the River Ouse. And that is where around about 75% of our incidents come from is in the round the ooze. We've got a smaller river which goes off that, which is the River Foss. Um, so so um, for people, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll zoom in here. Let me, if I just change my screen share over to maps. And if you're, you're listening to this on the podcast, um, I appreciate you can't see the map. Um, but what we're going to do is we're just going to take a look at where we're talking to David from. So, uh, David, you're in the UK. Yep. And uh, within the UK, we're talking York. Uh, I think I'm going in the right yep. direction. Up, up slightly. Head north slightly. There it is. Top center. That's it. So right into the middle of the ring road. So um, we can see here kind of really – Inland, uh, quite in, far in from the coast, and York's kind of an old city, right? Lots of yeah, you know, you've lots of nice buildings. Yeah, ve very old, uh, very old city. Still got city walls in there. Um, still got old towers. Um, 
sort of very medieval buildings and it goes all the way back through um, Viking and Roman times as well. And and so you've got this river. So this river is your primary concern, is that? That's the one. That's the River Ouse. So the the large grassed areas you see are part of a flood um, our flood defences. It's a water storage area for when the river comes up. Um, we've okay. got a number of bridges. Um, so a number of our incidents are actually gathered around the bridges. So as we're coming down into the centre of town, um, each of the these are our main landmarks. So the area that's in the centre of town now, or if, if we carry on going downstream a little bit. So am I going? Am I going up yeah, or down right. here? So just just at the bottom of the screen now is where we yeah. base ourselves. Okay, here. So just off to the right hand side. So that's where we base ourselves. So we can see a lot of what's going on. We've got a good view of the two main bridges. Directly opposite us is a selection of pubs, open areas, area, um, tables outside for drinks, meals, that sort of thing. Brilliant. Well, I can see comments starting to come in. We have good viewership on this. Um, if you are watching live, if you're watching on Facebook, YouTube, um, Twitter, there's lots of places we're broadcasting this live. Uh, if you just reply in the comments underneath the video, the comments come up live here. So um, we're able to see. So I can see there Mark, um, Mark Mullen coming in. Uh, excellent. Okay, so... Um, David, sorry, keep we'll keep going. That's all right. Uh, you were you're talking about you're doing proactive river patrols along uh, along this uh, along the river banks. Uh, you've got the boat out doing pro, pro, proactive patrols, and you thought when you started this would be mainly picking up the mess from the night scene. Yeah, that was that was our initial our initial thought was um, we will be dealing with drunks that fall in the river. Mm -hmm. um, so that is where. We sort of we concentrated the boat handling skills, so it's a case of we're going to be picking people out of the water, um, so man overboard type recovery, approaching casualties in water, yeah, and dealing with drunks. Yeah, it wasn't until we actually had our first operational shift, and the first incident we came across was someone who was having mental health issues, and at that point it was like, it was a bit of an eye opener for us. Oh dear, yeah. okay, we'll see if this is a one off. We'll see, and then it wasn't. We were getting more and more incidents involving mental health. So our training, the way we were set up, changed. Yeah. Um, the whole, the, the vast majority of the work we do is pill, dealing with people in uh, having mental health issues um, or missing persons, searches, that sort of thing. Uh, and who tasks you then? Where, where does that initial call come from? Initially, it's we've either got fire and rescue who deal with anybody that's in the water, so they'll yeah. request our assistance for that. They've also got their own fire boat on the river, but we also mm -hmm. respond to assist. Um, the other one is we get tasked by North Yorkshire Police. We've got a concern for safety here, or there's a missing person um, in this sort of area. Can you can yeah. you send the team out? Can you can you help with the search? You were good enough to send some photos through here. So this is the fire boat, is that right? Yeah, so our boat's on the left-hand side. Um, that's our patrol boat, and that should be getting – it's quite an old boat at the moment. We got it. It was at least second-hand when we got it. Yeah. Um, and we're looking at replace. Or we're looking at um, getting delivery of a new boat at the end of the year. The other boat that's on the right-hand side is Fire and Rescue's boat. Um, and we'll work what, together on jobs. What are your considerations in – Procuring a boat for a river like through York. What's the river called? Is it? Uh, what's it's the River Ouse. River Ouse. So, if you what what are the what are the complexities on that for you? What are the challenges? What, what are you looking for in a boat? Um, for us, it's we want something that will um, s sort of survive and just bounce off d a lot of debris that comes down the river. So, mm -hmm. especially if there's flood or just generally, and we get trees coming down, and we get rubbish coming down. It's, it's that sort of thing. It can be really shallow in places, especially if yeah. you're in search along the side. So we want a, a good, strong hull. So yeah. we're thinking about, well, we've gone for an aluminium hull. Um, okay. Quite a wide operating platform, good visibility for the helm. But we also want an area where we um, can put a basket stretcher in. Yeah. So if we do pull someone out of the water, 
and when you transport them somewhere safe or they've got sort of medical issues we want to be able to get a basket stretcher on their lay it flat and still deal with them um, that's the that's our idea for a boat a good platform for it so either the police or um fire and rescue control rooms can task you out um yes can initiate how do they how do they task you well, how does that call out work it's a we've got one phone which is um just a, a small an old well mobile phone really simple mobile phone it uh, it receives for it receives phone calls it sends phone calls but that's it um we think there might be a camera on it but nobody's ever used it because all we deal with is is texts and, and phone calls and that's it and um, the instant manager the on-call instant manager just, just passes that around so whoever's whoever's on next whoever volunteers to yeah. next, we'll, they'll just pick up the phone the phone rings we then log on to d4h and we use the text service within d4h and that's the one that alerts the calls to the, okay. to the rest of the on-call team so, so you're on call 24 7 aside from then proactively being out there as well yes um, we we've one first question in here and um, it's from neil uh, uh neil, Brewer. neil is in canada um in british columbia uh, so neil's wondering does local government help fund you so i guess so what public funding do you get um as the first part of that question yeah um not directly we can apply for grants same as a lot of the the volunteer teams um but nothing's ever guaranteed um, but there's no direct funding either comes from local regional or national government okay um, so so all fundraising yes it's all through fundraising what and i know you're all volunteers what kind of what kind of uh, funds do you need to 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 raise every year in a, in, within a city just to keep us going um we are we need about twenty five thousand pound a year okay um and that's just standard running costs yeah um we are looking at getting a, a building at the moment we don't have a building we don't have an office we don't have a, a headquarters where do you train just on the river on the river or open areas of land we've got york race course so that's ideal for doing uh, practicing rope work mm -hmm. practicing search areas um especially during the winter it's cold it's dark it's wet it's the best time to train yeah gotcha so the second part of neil's question is do you self-deploy or is it only the police and and i guess the important piece in that is can you self-deploy or your policies or health and safety procedures or anything would say that you you shouldn't without an official tasking if we are out on patrols mm -hmm. then if we see an incident we will respond to that but then if it's someone in in crisis some by the river we'll form for police backup um if it's someone in the river we form for fire and rescue and, and that's our memorandum of understanding with them. So if we come across something, we involve them. Uh, we want, if we get messages through social media or anything like that, our standard is either treble nine police, treble nine fire, use emergency services, get to them, because then everything's everything's logged, everything's recorded, and the proper response can get sent out. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Neil had another follow up here. Now, I think Neil might be just bragging here because they're one of the only organizations I know where they're fully, the volunteers are fully re reimbursed, but I can I can probably answer the question, you're not reimbursed. Um, no. But uh, BC SARA, British Columbia Search and Rescue, uh, for people who don't know them, they have a fantastic support by the uh, province and uh, Emergency Management BC uh, for the, on behalf of the province, effectively reimbursing the teams a lot of their expenses so they get they uh, can claim back for every uh, mile, hour, uh, person. Um, I believe there's possibly even a childcare allowance in there. Um, and, uh, um, you know, it, it's a really nice supported setup of volunteers. If people want to copy something somewhere, have a look and see what they're doing. I know there's other people looking at them. No, okay, so we're... Definitely, yeah. definitely not. <laughs> we're, we're doing well through, through the photos here. So this looks like an exercise um, you're doing, is that right? Yeah, we were invited to take part in a, lot, a very large um, emergency response demonstration day. So all emergency services were there. Um, we were taking part in the water side of things. So the scenario here was a couple of people driving along, went down a, um, an embankment, drove into the, a lake. Yeah, um, with a horse we, box attached by the look. Yes, yeah, it was a trailer with a horse box on. So we left Fire and Rescue to, uh, to deal with the, the dummy horse. Mm -hmm. um, 
large animal rescue is their thing, not ours. And, and we went into the we went into the car to extract the the driver and the passenger from the car. Um, the car had been fully cleaned out, um, so there was yeah. there was no danger of contamination for anyone. Um, for anyone who's never pulled somebody out of a car that's entered the water, what what are you trying to do? What's the first steps? Um, I um, you know, give a little insight into that. Um, the first thing we've got is. For us to either to open the door or go near a car, we need to stabilise the car. So we want to stop moving further. Um, you're never sure of what the what subsurface is. It might be a case of there's a ledge just slightly further out. So stabilise the car. Um, people in the car might be might be panicking. They might be trying to get out. And if the water level's rising, it's really difficult to open the doors until the water pressure equalises. Yep. Do you have so any what, tool to do that, or is there any method that, that you use? No, most cars nowadays, if they go into water and they go so deep into water, they're with the electric windows. The electric windows will automatically wind down. Yep. So that helps. Pre that helps with the um, equalise the pressure. Um, and as as I I learned the other day, even if you get water damage in your key, it can sometimes do down the windows, which I did not know. Yeah, it'll, <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll pop them. So don't go swimming with your car keys in your pocket. Yeah okay what's going on here i'm right. looking at a picture of a police officer they're kneeling down with sort of somebody with a life jacket um yeah we were taking part in um a large multi inc exercise a couple of years ago um it was um, a tour boat had crashed into the side of a the river um 80 people on board numerous casualties numerous incidents um, what we did is, there was a couple of our fundraisers. I mean, Jo here in the photograph is, she's one of our fundraising team members, and she volunteered to be a casualty for the day. So the tag you see round her uh, round neck and there's a little piece of paper on it, that is what is wrong with her. So um, she was able to, to give details to the police officer. So mm -hmm. she'd been through medical triage. She was all right. Um, she was released in the police care. Police then take record details of who's on the boat, where they come. And then they got handed over to um, the major incident response team as part of the council to go away to a safe area. Then get tea, coffees, dried off if they need to. So it's not just the operational team that get involved; the fundraisers do as well. So th this here looks like um, it, that looks like a triage map. Maybe she's on. I'm not yes. sure is the colour, and and so that's working with the NHS as well. Is it the yeah. the ambulance response to so, the local trust? Yeah, the ambulance crew were down there as well as the hazardous area response team. Yeah. Um, so we were, there was us and fire and rescue tech and the casualties off the boat because we didn't have access to the, the boat by land. Yeah. So all Fair the casualties enough. had to be uh, taken off by water. Um, they also threw in a couple of uh, code balls for us to say, yes, there was 80 people on board, but there's only actually 74 accounted for. So where's the rest of them? So we end up having to do a river search for anybody who's fallen over, overboard. And and so when you're working in a scenario like this, the the heart teams are the hazardous area response teams, uh, yeah. part of the NHS trust. So they're paramedics, I think, specially trained for maybe a, a going off the tarmac, should we say? Yes. Um. So it's confined space. They can wear breathing apparatus. Um. They work in a height. They're they're swift water responders. Um, swift water rescue technicians Excellent. so they do all sorts brilliant you can talk us through these they look like training yeah so um not all the training we do is down by the river so for example here it's the bottom of york race course a nice nice area nice open area some sunshine hopefully and it's just we're going through basic knots so this is the first mm -hmm. part of the technical rope work side of things we can use the trees to um, to rig up rope systems, um, and it's just a good open area where we can use. Very good. This looks like more flood rescue training. So you're kind of doing a lot of this stuff, I guess, and passing under bridges. Um, and, and how often are you training? What's the kind of how regular would you would you go out and get in the water as a team? Well, we've got. It tends to be every other week there's something going on um, yeah. now, be it we're bringing the probationers in or we've got the flood team or um, our normal boat crew, the helms, that sort of thing. It tends to be every other week that we train. 
um, the picture before was actually under one of the bridges and it was while the river was up in flood so okay if the river's up in flood we might as well get the uh, get the kit on go out and have a look um and it's just practicing drills this is the uh the welsher in cardiff is that right uh yeah. swift water training facility this yes, looks like so this a great is site. cardiff international white water um area it's the, you do kayaking there's rafting so members of the public can go down take the kayaks um but at the bottom so we don't bother with the kayaks or the rafts um we put dry suits on the pfds uh we swim in it or i get yeah. flushed down by it um, but at the bottom there's a mock-up of a house so we can take the boats in there and practice with a pair of boats and a ladder um trying to get people out of buildings trying to get them from upstairs down to evacuate them from a an upstairs room yeah it's great really cool what um, is this we've we do we get asked a couple of strange requests and it can be anything from um there's a boat coming down can you escort it or there's a viking festival going on with this one it's um, a local farmer had seen the fact that there was a world record for paddling a pumpkin down a river a giant pumpkin so sure enough he decided he was going to uh, hollow out this this pumpkin oh, and try the a, world record it's a real pumpkin <clears throat> it's a real pumpkin it's huge so i see a different boat there and it, it relates into this question that came in why not a pioneer style bathtub boat instead of a rib we've got our normal patrol boat is a rib um, and that's the one we use for for up and down normal shifts normal running um, what we've also got is we've got the the connector boat here so the flat bottomed and it's not got a prop on it it's got jet drive on it that's our one of our flood rescue boats and just so happens that at the time this was going on we had that in the river so we'll use that one on the river while the other one's getting out doing maintenance or so a bit of tender love and care getting what, his bottom scrubbed what's the advantage of this style of boat the flat bottom one that's there it's it can drive in about eight inches of water um we can put multiple people in it we, there's a couple of other surf life saving jb teams who've got a similar sort of boat and they actually all click together so you can make a very wide or very long platform stable platform ah, very good so if we're doing if we're dealing with wide area, wide area flooding we can then click a couple of these together and it could be a mobile command platform mm -hmm. it may be a case of we use it as a lily pad so the smaller boats the inflatable boats can go out get people bring them back to this one um it can be command and control we can put some fuel on it we can put refreshments on it um so Very it's good. our own little mobile operating area yeah excellent this looks like an incident ongoing yeah so we were down there and it's just a case of this is the back of our van um we operate out of um, a transit welfare welfare vehicle um so we've got who's the boat crew who's in charge of the event what the call signs are the initials of the people that goes um that's in it and then it's just a log that's written up because we find it's if you make the phone call rings the plate and the police so we've got a missing person description it's easier just to use a whiteboard and scribble on the whiteboard yeah and then you can you can put it down in your log afterwards very good so i'm seeing all this sort of patrol equipment and <clears throat> here you guys are out um it's a it's a nighttime shot i think you said to me this was a special night yeah this was um this was last year it was new year's eve we we gassed we do a normal Friday and Saturday night, but in liaison with the police, we can also come out at, at other times. So if there's any large race events on, if there's any um, special large sort of gatherings in York, we'll do that. But we also go out yeah. on Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve as well. And this was New Year's Eve this year. Well, just gone. So that was a little bit chilly. And the thoughts of that one was... There's gonna be a lot of people around. Yes, the pubs aren't necessarily gonna be open, but there's still gonna be people, a lot of people walking around because at the time in the UK, the pubs weren't open. Yeah. But what we have thoughts of is, are people gonna start bringing drinks down into town? Are they gonna have their own parties alongside the river? Mm. Cause it's a communal area. Um, and that was the main concerns from the police. So we put, a, we put a shift on for that. Very good. I've now, we've now got a picture of somebody checking a life boy. 
Yes, there's along the two rivers, there are life rings, um, large life rings, and they're, they're scattered all the way along the river. Something we keep an eye on, it's one of those things we don't have to, but it's just as we walk past, you can't help but look at the life ring, make sure it's not been tampered with, make sure the rope's coiled up properly um, and everything's in place. So that's part of your preventative search and rescue efforts. Yes, and it is just, it's that we'll, we'll go along and we use throw bags ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. But if you if you do need something, we know that at least in our area, the life rings are in a good state. Very good. So yeah, these are great pictures to get a, a sense of York. Um, we can see kind of the, the river you're dealing with, uh, lots of bridges and quite an urban area. Yes. Um, this one, we, we were called out by the police for missing person search. So it's, we've got a flood rescue team, qualified members. Um, and what we do is it's the same team, our York team, and it's just a couple of them are also um, flood rescue qualified. So we'll use their skills, we'll use their knowledge and their equipment and have on the, um, and we'll use them to bring um, an extra search capability. So as well as just doing the bank or the boat, we'll, uh, we'll go in. Very good. Um, question here from Robbie McKay again. Do you follow Jessup principles? Yes, we do follow Jessup principles. Um, we do work with that. Um, last year, I was actually on one of the, um, in North, well, in Yorkshire area, um, I was helping out with the, the Jessup for control room staff. Um, I was down helping doing the presentations for them. So yes, we do follow it. And when I chop onto the, um, our dashboard, you will see the, the top two lists are the fact that they've just updated the Jessup documentation and there's a reminder on the team to, um, to go have a look at the new doc documentation. But yes, we follow the principles. Okay. What is Jessup? It's the Joint Emergency Services Interoperability Protocols. So, so um, how you respond, what you do. Yeah, the idea being is um, when an incident starts, you you make sure you co-locate with the other incident commands. Mm -hmm. um, it's simple language. You communicate together. And um, you look at the risks. So you've got a joint understanding of risks. And then you can go off and actually do the tasks. Gotcha. Robbie says, thanks. And uh, the next question is about your helms. So what qualifications do your boat helms hold? The, the basic qualification for them is uh, the RYA Power Boat Level 2. Mm -hmm. So we'll take them into that and we'll start at that. Um, and after that, it then becomes um, river knowledge but we also expect them to be able to do a bit of instant command, um, command and control. Yeah. So it might be a case of they're sat on the boat, so they're the decision makers for responding to incidents. Um, and it might be a case of um, you've got a number of people in the water or you've got multiple casual incidents. They've then got to go through basically their own triage to who we're going to go for first. So mm -hmm. what we want is we want the helms to be able to drive a boat without even thinking about it because they've got everything else going on around them. So is that, did you mention RYA there? Did, yes. Uh, sorry, yes, the Royal Yachting Association? Yes, correct. Is that right? And so they, they've got a standard powerboat course, helm or coxswain course <laughs> of some form. Yeah, it's uh, a helm. Skills but, level. Yeah, powerboat level two is, is their standard to drive a boat. Um, mm -hmm. There's also an intermediate and up to an advanced course as well. But we're inland, um, we're in a river. So for us, it's the power boat level two is, is what we need. Very good. Okay, so yeah, you've got lots of equipment, a sled. I assume that's a stretcher here we're looking at as well. Yeah, the red is, we've got a sled just to the left of center, to the right of center is an inflatable stretcher. Um, and that's designed to go in through a doorway. So if oh, you're okay. working in the flood environment, it's narrow enough that you can open the go door, go through, go into a house, go to the bottom of the stairs, and if somebody's upstairs, they can slide down into the into the stretcher, mm. um, and we can walk them back out, therefore keeping them dry. Understood. So it, it might not be that they need a stretcher. You're using it as a float. Yes. Um, we can't get a normal-sized sled into a house. 
um, and it's we will use that. It might be a case of we need it as a stretcher um, because of an incident we're dealing with, but yeah. we can also use it for transport. Um, yeah, and it, it makes complete sense. So if they stay dry, um, therefore they stay warm, therefore we can stay on task a bit longer. Yeah. But as soon as they start getting cold and wet, we've got to uh, um, we've got to depart. Right. Uh, we had a Land Rover as our first operational vehicle, mm -hmm. and so this was this was down on our first operational day. Um, yes, it looked good. Yes, it could tow. Yes, it did that, but we couldn't really run instant on it. So when that was um, when that one went back to the supplier, we moved to a we moved to a transit welfare vehicle, and again, hopefully, at the end of this year, we're uh, we're going to take delivery of another one. Yeah. New purpose built okay. vans. Very good. And that's again the boat on day one. Vikings. Vikings. There's always Vikings in York. Um, again, it's one of them. There's a Viking festival every year, or normally every year. So th this isn't your boat? Um, no, we were asked to um, just go along and keep an eye on it. Um, and they they did row a good bit of the. Um, the way down to um, a marina slightly further downstream um the actual the team rode rode down there and it was a it's quite an impressive site i'm sure um neil's asking on average so how many incidents do you respond to every year as a team right last year we had we responded to 52 incidents um and in total we dealt with 87 ship 80 no we responded to 80 52 call outs yeah. uh, responded to 87 incidents in total. So that includes the ones we uh, we have on shift. Uh, but last year was, we didn't see a drop, even within people um, staying at home, not as many people been out, we still didn't see a reduction in the number of call outs. And this year is even, it's it's increasing even, even more. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So you've a, you do have a, a whole set of different boats. Um, you can see in equipment here. Yes, it's, uh, it's quite the fleet. Well, excellent. Um, that's been really interesting so far. Um, as people sort of are aware, as we were saying, you can you can type your question in on whatever platform you're watching this on, whether it's YouTube. Um, I think most of the comments have come in on Facebook so far, um, and thank you for those. Uh, but but we're here in live and we're taking your questions. So. David, you said you wouldn't mind sharing your screen uh, with D4H. We might have a look at how you're running the, effectively the administration of the team, right? Your records management um, yeah. and, and to keep that going. So um, for, for people who aren't familiar, this is D4H. We're sort of looking at a combined dashboard here of uh, personnel training, incident reporting, and equipment management. Can, can you talk us through a little bit? Yeah, uh, David, so what we're looking at? Um, there's one of the previous questions we um we had about the jessip oh there we go up in the whiteboard um the new Jess the new um jessip doctrine was out a couple of days ago so there's a, a reminder up there and i've set this for two weeks so a reminder for the team to um whenever they log on and see it they've got to go read the document and we'll then use the collaboration side of things and they'll sign on collaboration to say they've read it um, and we've also is that got, learning is, is that e-learning package is that that's on another website that they'll go to that's on the jessip that's on the jessip website have you seen that you can add links to directly to that from the whiteboard so i'm whiteboard. always trying to help people use this better um, no but thank you yeah so um if you if you press uh if you click on the whiteboard top left so we'll do this live um oh add add note uh, no, on the just the word whiteboard, I think, will bring you there. Not clickable. Uh, <laughs> uh, logistics or intelligence and whiteboard, whichever it's in. Logistics, I think. Yeah. So can you edit? Uh, ah, there we uh, go. That? Link. Oh, you can't edit a note, but yeah, when you if you press add note there, you'll see there's a there's a URL option, and that link is clickable from the dashboard by the member. Oh, it also appears on the mo you can see external link there. It also yeah. appears on the mobile app. So when they open the dashboard of the mobile app, the home screen, uh, which we have a new version coming out very soon, uh, which I think you're all going to like a lot, uh, you'll you'll get that link straight away, so the, the user can click straight through. Okay. Right. Sorry, I've taken you off track. Let's let's hit the dashboard again. 
Every so, day so we, whiteboards, and we might do that a few times through here because it's always good. And uh, everyone kind of watching is learning as well. The, the whiteboard is how you're you're kind of communicating new notes, things you'd write on a whiteboard if you had a station, a rest yeah. base. And, and what we what we'll do is we link to we've got the certain documentation, um, the the operational documentation or the management side of things that we've actually created a qualification for as well. So when someone goes into the collaboration side of a document to say I've read it, um, it's one of the team, sort of one of the training team will go in, take that, take that comment and requalify them to say yes, they've read that document. Because that's an easy way to track who's who Makes said they read the documents. It, and we're, we hope to improve that actually by um, there's two pieces we'd like to do. Uh, one is that we'd like to make documents to have a re effectively a, a um, I've I've read this or I understand this button on the document. So yeah. you can read. issue a new memo and people can proactively confirm once they're they're done. Yeah, read um, receipt. So yeah, so that, that's one piece. Uh, the second thing we'd like to do is allow people to submit their own qualifications. So say, I've done this, and then an editor or admin just has to press approve. Um, so taking kind of one of the steps out. Okay. Yep, so that's the that's the whiteboard um, draft. So at the moment, here we go. Um, we, we try and log as much as we can. So for example, I've got the live stream. Mm -hmm. So that's this one. We've also got our phase run, so our probation and training is also running tonight. Um, and we've got a number of team members down attending that. Um, last couple of days, we've had a call out and a missing person search. Now, the missing person search on here didn't have, hasn't got a call out number. So that was one that we we actually alerted to while we're on shift. So for us, it's a case of if it's got a call out number, um, we know that's something that um, I was coming out of our normal shift time, but this is a the missing person search was a, was one we just yes we're on shift we got a phone call can you give us a hand searching for this person? Gotcha. List of incidents. Uh, this is really handy for for us. For example, for applying for grants, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. It's it's really really simple to pull that information together. So how many callouts? How many incidents? But then if you want to. Um, if we're talking with a resilience forum, in this case, of what sort of instance have you been? What sort of we classify them as well. Um, and again, that's good to look for either hotspots in not just uh, in locations, but <clears throat> um, the types of instance as well. So, is it a missing person search? Is it a domestic violence? Is it? Um, it could be a person in the water anything so i'm not sure this question from ravi mckay that's come up here is the exact same piece but it, it's related to categorizing call out so he's wondering do you break it down to categories to try and reduce it through multi-agency working um yes we break it down into categories um we categorize each of them okay and we'll, yeah i'm not sure about the second bit no no i and you know, I might, might be retasking stuff out. Um, I'm sure we'll get a, an update now. Um, okay, excellent. Yeah, so we're getting a full picture here of everything coming up, everything that's happened recently, everything that you've got to do within tasks. So you can see working on handbooks and um, pieces like that. You've got a calendar of events upcoming or what's happening now. And then we can see yeah. who's on call um, tonight. Yeah, so there's a, there's our on call team. Um, so we've got 11 members on call at the moment. So for us, if if the phone did ring, it's nice and simple. Um, click on the communication and send a message. We only use the, the text message service for call-outs. Uh, okay. We don't use it for sending general information to people. Uh, that way that if someone's got a, a really annoying ringtone attached to their phone, attached to the call-out number, um, they know it's important. Yeah. Very good. Um, we we um, one of the things you can possibly even do there is you could add two phone numbers. I think you could achieve that, um, and you could have a, a priority and a non-priority one, something like that, if you wanted. Yeah, for um, any routine one, we use uh, we use emails. Ah, okay, gotcha. 
So um, that's excellent. Um, can you keep going through? I think you've, you've yeah. got a so page we've got, of incidents um, and these things. So we've got the, our incidents, um, and this is going back to, to when we started, so the start of January 2015. And it just it gives us the hotspots of where the um, geographical, what the incidents were. So as expected, the vast majority of incidents we deal, we deal with are right bang in the middle of um, York. Yes. It, it, the the button on the bottom left of the map makes that map full screen. I think it'll work quite well on this, this screen share. Lovely, yeah. yeah okay. could, could you Can you zoom in a little bit and just let us see? How the kind of clustering changes and it's going to redraw everything so you've got yeah. an idea here of where the hot spots are um, and it's yes. pretty clear actually i can see you know two, is it 200 there in the middle um something like that. 208 just in that area yeah so, so a high number of those yeah so i say a lot of ours are centered around the bridges mm -hmm. um, and that's normally um mental health issues that sort of thing um there's someone on the wrong side of the power pit there's someone um, threaten to jump. There's, there's this, there's that, there's the other. But we also find because, I mean, some of the bridges, the bridge up here is a footbridge, but some of the other ones, the road bridges, and because there's so many people on a Friday, Saturday night walking from one side of the river to the other with a couple yeah. of beers, we have had a couple of people have been knocked over um, on the bridges. So person versus car, um, and because we got a boat and a trauma kit in the on the river in patrol were a nice asset to really quickly get up and down the river if needed. Yes. Um, so yeah. um, we can we can if, respond. If you keep zooming in on that on the the kind of bridge in the middle, I assume it'll break apart those pins and break apart those pins. And we we see quite a lot of people. What they'll do is they'll they'll take a screenshot of something like this, and you're able to go to the local city council or county council or whoever it might be, and say, look here here are the facts. This is absolute. Fact: the this is the incidents are happening on the bridge. We want a sign on every bridge that gives this is bridge number one or bridge A or bridge B, whatever it might be. Call you know call nine 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 and ask for water rescue or York rescue boat or whatever. Um, you know, it's a really good way to acquire funding. Is is showing these maps off? They're very visual. You can even show them to local businesses. So you might have, um either a shopping center along here or a, a pub or something like that. And you go in with the hotspot map of here are the incidents in the last five years that have occurred outside your premises. And we're voluntary and we need these funds. It's a very, very visual way uh, to, to raise money. Yeah. I mean, we are working with the um, city of York council at the moment. They've asked us to be, um, to take part in some surveys and just walking around town on, a Friday, Saturday night, looking for hotspots, not necessarily by the river, but we're just, mm -hmm. we're another pair of eyes. So we think about things slightly differently. Yeah. Um, and so we've been doing that a bit with the, the local council. There we go. There's um, Neil saying here as well, they've got a huge increase in Canada in SAR calls due to COVID. And I think in their <laughs> scenario, or as I understand it, it's, it's the wilderness um, setting there is, is that people are being drawn out into the wilderness to escape cities and they're going out and they're doing recreational activities. What you've seen an increase as well, David, in, in during lockdown. Was, what did you put that on? It was mental health, is that right? Yes, so a lot of it was mental health, um, people with mental health issues. Um, so the pressures of um, the worry, not being able to get out, not being able to see friends. Mm -hmm. Um, it was that sort of side of things we were seeing, but it's we we see changes, and again we can we can map this through from D4H. We can see changes to the type of incidents, so the the age range that we deal with. Um, yeah, the, we've got two universities and a large college in York as well, so we're a big university town. So coming to about now, we will start to see a change. The number the the age of the people we deal with will start to reduce. And the main reason for that one, it's university students have, for a lot of them in the year one, this is the first year they've been away from home. Mm -hmm. So homesickness kicks in, give them a couple months away from home, they're missing the home, they're missing the family, um, they've ran out of clean clothes, they, they're missing the mum's cooking, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah. we do see that sort of incident, and we see an increase around about this time, and it'll go on for about another two months. Uh, and it'll start to tail off just around the Christmas period. Okay. 
Makes sense. Interesting the different sides of urban versus versus sort of wilderness response. If yeah. if you hit escape there, it'll it'll drop us out of that full screen and we can <clears throat> and keep yeah. going on. That was fantastic. So we go. Um, I've also got uh, member roles. Now, mm -hmm. what we've got here is especially on the training side of things, because we are a registered flood team and we're an, we're a national asset on the flood team under the the DEFRA concept of operations in here, and that's the overarching document. It says in there that we need to do a certain amount of training so often, and initially we were finding it hard to track specifically what training we were doing, whether it's in water, whether it's not in water, for each of the different levels. Yeah. So we've created a couple of um, roles, and we use multiple entries. So we might have one training day, but we'll use between nine o'clock in the morning and ten o'clock, it was it was land based training. So it was it was flood team training, but it wasn't yeah. in the water. And then from from ten through to maybe two o'clock in the afternoon, it was in water. So we then log that this is the amount of in water hours. So still under one training day, under one yeah. training entry, each person might have a couple of different things because of the different um, tasks that were going on or the different roles that were getting taught. That's really handy that we can use the roles and we can bring up the reports later on to say this is the this is the people that are involved, this is the number of hours. So yes, they have done the CPD hours to keep in date for that qualification. And this is the easiest way sense. we found to do it. Yeah, I think you're role. right. Yeah, it, it, it is it's it's something I I wish we had some better functionality on and we've um we have it sort of spec'd out, but it's just always sitting one behind in the priorities, which is is logbooks effectively. And we really want to nail logbooks. We want to nail it logbooks really well on mobile, um, where where you can capture these competencies, um, where yes, this person trained in this, yes, they did these hours in a, with an approval process as well. Yeah, but that's the so that's the way we that's the way we do it. So we set up a training, but that's also we use a first aid, um, but because we've got a couple of qualified instructors. To, to keep the instructors up to date, they need to do so many teaching hours mm -hmm. um, to maintain their competency. So that's why on, on this screen, we've got, for example, um, we've got first aid, so people who are in training first aid, but anything that's INS after is the instructor. Instructor. So um, for example, um, training level three, uh, flood level three instructor, or instructor in water. So mm -hmm. how how many how many hours were we actually in the water, or was it in the middle of a, a field somewhere? And we're training between two trees, and it differentiates between the two. Very good. Could could you jump on to qualifications next? Because it keeps it within yeah. the the same personal training kind of scope. <clears throat> so this yeah. screen is all all of your cer certificates and qualifications, and um, I know you have a feature request here. Yes. Uh, but, I have, and it's it's one of those niggling things. Um, because I'm the trainer manager, I like seeing green bars all the way along, and I like yeah. seeing 100%. Um, if I don't see 100%, I know that it's something I need to concentrate on. So, for example, on this one, um, if I go down to the, the flood team, so we've got eight newly qualified DEFRA level two, so that's the, the wading routines, that's the first responders. Um, we've got eight of them, and they're qualified. Um, we've only got eight. They're a yep. team of eight. Um, all of them are still in date for qualification, but the bar, the percentage bar, only shows 13%. Yep. Now, I so only need 18. I only yeah. need eight qualified. I've got eight qualified. Nobody's not qualified. They're all in date. Yep. But when I go to the, the first screen, it's only shown 18%. Yeah. From a, a bit of sort of jiggling around, it's a case of... My understanding is the the eight is taken from all the members on um, that's registered on D4H, and therefore it yeah. gets to the thirteen percent. It's it's eight 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 out of your whole team, not yeah. just eight out of eight. Yeah. Now with that I one, the eight out of eight. I completely agree with you. This should be better visualized. It should it should not only I don't think it should even be a percent. I think it should be. Uh, some sort of marker per person so you can see visually that there are less people qualified in that uh, than there are in um, PPE above it there. That yeah. Maybe you, you should be able to tell I've got 20 of those, and I've got eight of these, but both are green. 
uh, that is that is what we'd like to see. But yeah, um, for me as the trainer manager, this this green, I want this green bar up here somewhere. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> but, yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks for showing that. And the just for people who are watching here, the the little kind of amber exclamation mark beside the next expiry date suggests it's coming into the warning period. So somebody in there, there's some action needed. Um, yeah. Next. Um, and then you can see ones with no expiry, potentially their life, lifelong qualifications. They don't. Yes, they are. Need to be refreshed. Um, the only time we'll we'll um, we'll reset the lifetime qualifications is if there's a major change. So, for example, with a D4H user, um, if there was a whole major rewrite, um, I can see you shaking. If there was a whole major rewrite for D4H and a total different way of doing things, we'd go in and would actually put a completion date on the. Yeah um on the d4h screen so they'd, they'd show us as completed um and then out of date again makes sense it's, it's the same as with a note on the dashboard about jessip so there's there's new documentation out so i'm going to go around and i'm going to manually complete everyone so i'm going to manually force everyone out of date for qualification so that we can then see them that, that as they start to go back in qualification again Ah, okay. Very good. Yeah, that makes sense. Because then we can okay. see who hasn't. Makes sense. Okay. Uh, what's left? We've got equipment and reports I can see yeah. in your tab. So, we've got equipment. so basic list of equipment. Um, we've got a couple of team members who um, need to check some some bits of kit. So um, it should have been done the start of the month, so 12 days ago. Um, haven't been done yet, so they're, they're people we need to we need to check up on. But we've also got things like um, road tax of the vehicles, so we've got that in here as well. Mm -hmm. So we get a nice reminder if the road tax is due, if insurance is due, um, it, it comes up on the inspections, and it'll it'll flag it. Um, we've got we're playing around with some ID cards, and actually tracking ID cards, um, or we put an expiry date on them. So this is the, the equipment that's expired. Okay. A um, couple of bits of equipment to monitor. A couple of team members have got some some different PFDs, so the new style PFDs. So we'll put a monitor on that, so we can we can have a look at them more often. How are they How are they holding up? How are they doing this? As well as the regular inspections. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll put the monitor flag on just to say we need to keep a, a slightly more in depth or more regular. Yeah. Um, have a look at them. T tell me your your ID cards. How yep. do you get those arranged for members? That's always a question we hear from teams. We print them ourselves. On a on an ID card printer. Yeah, we've got an ID card printer. Um, we can print them ourselves. Um, Very good. There's so it's really easy if if we've got the photographs in it for it's the same photographs as on D4H. Um, we've got the crew reference number. Yeah. Um, we've got an expiry date that's on the card. So if someone does leave and doesn't hand in the ID card, the expiry date will, will run out. Um, okay. It, good. Because we print ourselves, it's really easy to manage. So so a, a, a good add on there. Um, if you print a QR code or barcode on the on the ID card with anything in it, once it's unique, it can be their member ref. That's fine. Uh, or you use an, an NFC ID card, so you can get yep. an NFC chip in an ID card. Our new personnel app, the version currently in the App Store, you can associate a QR code, RFID, like an NFC, or a barcode with that member. And then you can just scan the card. So if you want to look up their qualifications, have they done the Jessup uh, hmm. refresh? You can just tap the card or scan it, scan the QR code. It'll bring up their profile and you can click straight into their qualifications. It works really well. Um, so that that's currently on the App Store. We haven't promoted it yet because we're waiting on the next version of the app. Um, we're going to look at possibly shipping NFC stickers to everyone. Uh, that's currently in the works. We, or they'll certainly be available. But we're hoping to issue some to people. Um, and the idea will be you can stick the sticker on your helmet, on your ID card, wherever you want, or you can encode it into your ID card, just any tag you want. 
um, and it will mean that you can look people up on the app. So it works at the moment. You'll see it. It's, you'll find it in settings on the personal training app in the app store. Uh, but we're going to do a bit of, we'll be doing some promotion around that in the next couple of months once we've got some other pieces finalized. All right. Great. Great. So you have all your equipment loaded up in here. It's going to proactively tell you if there's an expiry date coming <clears> up. It's going to proactively tell you if there's an inspection due. You're going to get emails and um, it's flagging on the dashboard too. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Um, and it's so we, we have a look at locations. We've got various locations down. Um, what's issued to team members? Um, so the team members know what, what kit they've got. Um, and they'll sign any of the, the issued PP that they've got that needs to be checked. It's their responsibility to, to check. So yeah. they, uh, so these ones, are, these inspections due on the left-hand side, um, our equipment manager will be sending a nice message to people saying, come on, get it going, get it tested. The, um, the last screen there is report. So I guess yeah. you put all this information in, it's important that you can get it out again. Yeah, so here we go. Um, we've got the standard reports. So the annual, the quarterly, or the monthly reports, uh, which are the ones that's fixed. Uh, we, we've created quite a few custom reports, um, and a lot of these are to do with um, either someone external wanting to, how much of this have you got, how much of that have you got. Um, we also have a look at everyone starts off, and the team, everyone starts off as a foot patrol team member. So they're out. Um, they're walking up and down the rivers and we'll say right if you've done if you've logged so many hours um you've done this you've done that you've done the other um you've attended a certain amount of training courses then we'll we'll then put you forward to the next step and if you want to go and train up as boat crew you can do now instead of trolling through everyone's individual record using the sort of the custom reports is a really quick and easy way to do that um and yeah. these are the ones we've just built up over time Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm delighted you're getting getting so much use out of it. Um, we don't have it to share today. We've only got, got a minute left on this. It's been really good so far, but you've also started with incident management. I understand you're building out what we call plays. They're like scenarios in it. So you'll have all your pre-assigned roles. If you know the same incident is a, a recurring one, you can play that scenario out in advance, start assigning people straight into roles. Is that, is that right? Yes, so um, using the hotspot, um, the map for the incidents, um, we yeah. know the type of incidents, we know how we respond, we've got the history of them. So we'll just, we'll use the bridges to start with the main one um, and we'll go from there on the on the incident management. Yeah, brilliant. Well, we look forward to working with you on that. Uh, is, it, is there anything, we're just coming up on, on the air here, uh, David, and it's been fantastic talking to you. I think it's been a, a really, really good, uh, interesting listen for people i think there's two sides to it one is one is that we're you know you're a slightly different team than we've talked to before because you're a small voluntary team uh which we haven't done a huge we did hawaii last week i think yeah. um but um you know york couldn't be much much more different uh from hawaii usa to york uk a uh, very very different setups but look you've the same challenges fundraising training equipment maintenance keeping the show on the road um so it's really interesting um, and i hope hope it's a good contrast for people to see um how other teams are operating i hope you get some ideas out of it some training ideas out of it and uh, maybe you got an insight into d4h there and saw some different way to configure your account up um there's been loads of questions it's been great uh and uh, david have you anything else to to, to add into this or uh, i can only just say thank you again no, thank you for D4H. It's made our life an awful lot easier. We've used it from okay. the start. That's great to hear. Well, this recording is straight away. It's available on YouTube if you want to watch it back. Um, the podcast goes out on Google Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, all of the pieces um, that are there. We've got some comments flying in now. Um, if um, <laughs> Hawaii is coming to York, Mark, there's no... Um, <laughs> Um, so that the, the, I can't remember what I was saying at this point, but uh, the, the podcast is everywhere. The recordings on YouTube, uh, Facebook, everywhere. So uh, do share it out. It's really useful for us people to share it. And uh, thanks, a big thanks again 
to to David for that and to your Cresty book.